Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the University of Birmingham. I'm joined this week by Dr. Matthew Powell, who's been one of your mentors over the course of the last week, two weeks. Matthew, how have you seen the last week go? Uh, it's been extremely interesting, extremely enjoyable um, debating different issues with different people. One of the um, issues, um, one of the themes that's come out of the discussions in terms of the um, boards on chivalry has been the idea of where this myth has come from and why it might still be perpetuated to this day. I was wondering if you could, if you had any thoughts on that at all. Yeah, thanks for that, Matthew. It's a really fascinating area how these myths come about. Chivalry is just one example of the myths that we have to deal with in history and in historiography. The chivalry one in particular is comes from seven factors. One of which is the image or trying to portray the image of warfare without hatred. Warfare without hatred. Of warfare that means something noble, that means there's a just cause. It then immediately interlinks into just war theory and into the, the concept of the knights of old. Some of which has fed its way into the international law of armed conflict and use in bellow. I think the next side of it is that in comparison to the stories, whatever the realities, but the stories of the blood, the gut, and the gore of the trenches, knights jousting in the air gives this feeling of invulnerability, this feeling of a higher plane, no pun intended, but a higher level of warfare. Yeah. Does that feed back into some of the comments we've been getting? Uh, certainly, um, a lot of the comments have been relating to why people may want to um, join the RFC in terms of getting out of the horrors of the trenches as they're seen. I, I, horrors of the trenches tends to be related to another myth, that it was absolutely horrible. Whereas the reality of these things was that quite often it was boredom. Yes and the Royal Flying Corps offered something very different from boredom, that's for sure. It might not have been a long life expectancy, but with aviators to this day, there is a feeling of, it'll never happen to me. Yes. It'll never happen to me. It's always somebody else. So there's the excitement, there's the bravado, there's this way of actually going into a fight on equal terms on your own, as opposed to relying on the mass serried ranks. Does that make sense? C certainly, uh, it is certainly something that I've come across in my research on the First World War in terms of the fact that most troops spend very little of their time in frontline trenches and most of it is spent actually behind the lines um, on rest and relaxation and training. Yeah, and not much relaxation but plenty of training yes. and plenty of, uh, of plenty of boredom. I think these myths continue for a variety of reasons and part of it is that it's nice to have something to look back on. One of the things I've noticed throughout the, uh, the comments this week is the number of other myths that people then build on and yes. we end up with almost like a house of cards of myths as people have said, well, it's more like this, it's more like that. And the horrors of the trenches is just one yes. example of yep. that. But one of the things that underlies running a MOOC such as this is the opportunity for us to present to you all of the myths, some of the myths and the way these myths take hold and to invite you to take a deeper analytical approach to these things and not really just accept things at face value. One of the other things we've been looking at this week has been the role of industry, the role of women within industry and how the industry, the technology has had to spool up over the course of the First World War to cope with the demands. How's that debate been going, Matthew? Um, I think the most interesting debate on that aspect, Peter, has been the role of women in the First World War in terms of how they become into industry, how they come into industry, and um, why this may have happened. And the fundamental question that was asked on the discussion board was: Were women exploited in this? Yeah, I think the exploitation issue is is an important one. What's the general trend of responses to that been? It's been mixed. Um, a lot of the responses have been along the lines of, yes, women were exploited, but at the same time, it gave them the opportunity to show what they were capable of in the industrial workplace on a larger scale than had been seen previously. Yeah. I think there's some really issues, really interesting issues that come out of that. If you start looking at some of the census returns, and some of you will have seen my comments on this uh, on the, the posts, 
um, for the period either side of the First World War. And you look at somewhere like Birmingham and the roles that women undertook. It's very difficult to imagine in 2014 just what was expected of working class families in 1914 and in the decades either side. And what we see is people leaving school as young as 12, 13, 14, 15, and either going into service, which we just don't think about no. these days, no. people going to wait at table and to clean other people's homes en masse. But we also see in Birmingham in particular, many, many people going into manufacturing industries and the range of the crafts, the range yeah. of the skills, the range of the jobs that they go into is really quite extraordinary. From the candlestick makers, the bread makers, to the silver polishers, to the, and the list is endless. It is, yes. Yeah. Um, anything further on that side of it? Um, it's been interesting that people haven't or didn't understand before this how quickly the aviation industry in Britain develops from its low base in the pre-1914 period up to 1918. I think that's right. Um, I think we have to look at the tiny scale of the Royal Flying Corps and the aviation industry. It was almost literally a cottage industry. But as aviation proves its worth over the course of the First World War, it has to do better. It has to. But the same is occurring across the whole front. We have what one commentator has called the only ever true revolution in military affairs, as heavy artillery on an industrial scale, as aviation on an industrial scale, and as massed troops, huge scale numbers of soldiers, all come together. And that has to be furnished. It means people are coming out of the factories, it means women are stepping forward into those roles. Yes. I think where we choose the title I'd noticed the odd comment or two where people said, I thought I was signing up for aviation. Whereas really my view is aviation comes of age, but it's not just aviation. It's the whole of society, the whole of the manufacturing industry. Yes. And we're into total war. Warfare yes. is coming of age and it is all part of that. And bar the odd comment or two, I think we've had a really interesting set of discussions over this last week. We've also been asking people to reflect on how are things going? How well are things developing over the course of the, the MOOC? Given that it's a three week process, we can't hope to cover anything. What are we missing? Um, a lot of people have said they'd like more in terms of the technical aspects of the aircraft. Um, a lot of people have wanted more things in terms of artillery reconnaissance, artillery observation, um, the development of tactics and how the Germans and the RFC are changing tactics and looking to outdo each other. Yeah, there's probably some, some interesting stuff to come out of that. And I've been conscious that we've been taking a pretty high level view of everything we've been looking at in the MOOC. Yes, there are bound to be, particularly with something like aviation, let's have more detail, let's have more techie detail. And of course, there are other fora where that can be gained. Um, it leaves in the back of my mind a question as to whether we should have a separate program to cover just that. Because a similar criticism or a similar comment rather than a criticism I've been noticing is you're covering an awful lot in yes. the three hours. And with the material that we've given um, in terms of references and links and so forth, um, it's taking a lot of people a lot more than three hours because it's genuinely fascinating stuff. It certainly is fascinating. Um, one thing I'd like to pick up on there, Peter, is that just because something hasn't been included within the readings or within the articles or the videos does not mean that you cannot discuss it with myself, Peter or James. We have a wide range of knowledge on air power in the First and the Second World Wars because I've noticed that as the discussions have gone on, we've had more on the Second World War and we would be more than happy to field the questions that you have in those areas. Uh, absolutely. What are we going to be looking at next week? Uh, next week we will be looking at the creation of the Royal Air Force. So the creation of the Royal Air Force and we'll be looking at the, the fear and fascination of flight and how that continued through a period of depression through the 1920s and we'll look at some of the air displays, the air shows that were taking place at Hendon where we did a lot of the original filming and at the end of the week James, Matthew and I will be returning to Hendon to recap on how we think the three weeks have gone and look at some of the big issue questions that we've been there. 
But Matthew, thank you for all the work that you've done over the last couple of weeks. Thank and you. we'll look forward to the next week. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.